chapter 5 this evening. And you're going. I'm going now. Mm -hmm. You didn't tell me. Oh, you're going now. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad Action. I didn't say anything wrong. <laughs> we did have prayer before, so. Yeah. Good evening. We're glad to have everybody here. We're doing what every Christian should know about Satan by Bob Phillips and Rob Phillips, and uh, we're looking this week at chapter five. Chapter Exodus. No, in that book. In oh, that book. book. Yeah. Yeah, we're we're doing a chapter a week. Okay. Yeah. So there's twelve chapters. So <clears throat> this one is the title for Satan is the father of lies. And I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Fletcher Reed, but he's from uh, England, and uh, we see. Uh, that he is portrayed by an actor by the name of John Kerry. He was in a film called Liar Liar. And it was about a little boy who wished his dad couldn't lie because his dad lied continuously and broke his promises. And so he just, you know, wished that on his birthday, I believe it was, that his dad couldn't lie for one day. And so his dad was a lawyer. And so it's kind of a, you know, a comedy of errors, the things that happened, but he, in the end, learned that it's always best to tell the truth. Well, <clears throat> we see that uh, Satan is an incorrigible liar. And we see the very term father of lies to describe Satan. Uh, Jesus named him uh, during a time of uh, an encounter with the religious leaders of his day. They were plotting to kill him. Jesus told him he knew about it and he contrasted his father, which was God, with their father, which was Satan. And the scribes and Pharisees <clears throat> claimed to be uh, children of Abraham and Jesus told them, no, you're descendants of Abraham, but you're not true children of Abraham because if you were, you would believe in me. And so if you want to <clears throat> follow along, it's in John chapter 8. And we're going to look at verses 42 through 47. John chapter 8. And we're going to actually maybe look at it twice depending on how far we get. We're just going to get the synopsis now and then we'll look at it more in detail later. But in John chapter 8 verse 42, Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me because I came from the father and I am here. For I didn't come on my own, but he sent me. Why don't you understand what I say? It's because you cannot listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he speaks from his own nature because he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Who among you can convict me of sin? If I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? The one who's from God listens to God's word. This is why you don't listen, because you are not from God. So, Jesus having this uh, <clears throat> altar with the uh, Jews, he says that, uh, you know, all these different things, and take a minute to look at some of them. Notice he says he not only is presenting the truth, but he is truth. And remember, Jesus tells us in other places, like John 14, 6, that I'm the way, the truth, and the life. We see that he is the eternal Son of God. And he left all the glory of heaven to come to the glories of earth. And we know that <clears throat> he declares the truth of the Father, and he claims, I and the Father are one. And that's how he knows what the Father uh, wants him to say and to speak. And because the Father sent him, they are to believe in him if they believe in his Father. 
he would be their father too. But because they rejected the truth, that is the truth about who Jesus is as the Messiah, uh, <clears throat> they're neither children of God nor are they true sons or true children of Abraham. Rather, as we just read, they are children of the devil. And as such, they seek to suppress the truth. They want to kill the one who is truth incarnate, and murder and lies are their ta tactics precisely because that's what their father uh, is all about. Now, notice that as Jesus refers to Satan as a murderer and a liar, <clears throat> in the same context, we see that Satan is a liar with a murderous intent. Uh, Peter tells us he's like a roaring lion looking to see who he may devour. But it's more than this. He, he said he was a liar and a murderer from the beginning. Now, we've got to ask ourselves, what what's he mean here? Now, when I first was thinking about this, I thought about Cain and Abel. That was the first murder. And I uh, thought, well, that's probably what it reference was. But Philip says, no, it's further back than that. It's Adam and Eve. And so we see that uh, the beginning of which Jesus speaks here, he is a murderer from the beginning. It's a reference to Satan's first appearance at the stage of human history, that is the temptation of Eve in the garden. So let's think back upon this just a little bit. If you want to turn to Genesis chapter 3, we'll look at the first seven verses together. But think about this encounter. God had just finished his work of creation. He had just pronounced everything very good. Which means that at that point, Satan had not fallen. Mm -hmm. But somewhere between God pronouncing and saying he's going to rest on the seventh day, and Adam and Eve being in the garden, Satan fell and took some other fallen angels with him. And so we see that in the gardens, uh, God had made access to every tree and only restricted their access to the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, Genesis 2 ends with a depiction of innocence. It says, both the man and his wife were naked, yet felt no shame. Now, that's important. We remember that. That's how chapter 2 ends. Because when we get in chapter 3, things change radically. So Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. <clears throat> now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit from the tree in the garden. But about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat it or touch it or else you will die. No, you will not die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Now the woman saw that the tree was good for food, delightful to look at, desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of the fruit <clears throat> And she also gave some to her husband, who was uh, with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew they were naked, so they sewed fig trees together and made coverings for themselves. So before they fell, they were both a man and his wife were naked, yet felt no shame. Immediately after the fall, the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew they were naked, so they sewed fig trees together and made coverings for themselves. In this, Satan, the father of lies, you know, is in the middle of the reason uh, for the fall. He uh, suddenly appears in the garden as the serpent. You know, and we talked about this, how it may be a reference, actually, to... Uh, the anointed guardian cherub, because the Hebrew word, you know, coincides with uh, serpent. And so uh, it could just meant that he was one of the many angels there to wait upon God 
And uh, anyway, he comes to her. She's not scared. She's not frightened uh, by him talking with her. And so they probably had had meetings with other, you know, angels and cherubs. Remember, angels and cherub and seraphim are different. That the angels, you know, they are servants of God. They're the ones that are messengers, uh, mess messengers that you know do God's will. But the seraphim and cherubim are those that surround God's throne, and they're really there to praise Him and protect Him. But seraphim and cherubim are not angels, and angels are not seraphim and cherubim. <clears throat> okay, let's uh, think about some things about this first seven verses that we looked at. First of all, Satan comes disguised to Eve. <clears throat> Notice the evil one, the Bible calls him a beast, they call him a dragon, insidious monster and he inhabits the spiritual realm. Yet when he breaks into the physical world, he doesn't come as himself. He always uh, comes in some seductive costume. Remember, Paul says he can appear as an angel of light, so he can look like a good angel, in other words. And so he can take up all these different types of uh, disguises. <clears throat> and the reason for this is so he can appeal to the flesh. Now, it's not lipstick on a pig. It's a transformation. <clears throat> He's totally different than what he really is. And he dis uses disguises to attract us to him and, and his wiles, what he's trying to get us to fall into. <clears throat> so we see that the evil one possesses great knowledge of the truth, but he has no affection for it. And that's what Jesus is talking back in John chapter 8. He knows the truth. He can quote the Bible quite well, but he only quotes it to twist it and to use it for his own wickedness. We see that uh, he makes himself a beautiful friend. He is nevertheless a sworn enemy of the truth, and he wishes to make us his allies. <clears throat> and he does this because he hates God more than he hates anyone or anything else. Second of all, Satan catches us alone. And that's what he did with Eve. Since God has uh, yet to create Eve, when he gave this command to God, to Adam about, uh, let me see if I can find it. Uh, chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. Dennis, you got that? Read that for me. Verses 16 and 17, chapter 2. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may eat, freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for on the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Okay, this is the what God told him. Eat of any tree in the garden, any of them, except for the one in the middle, and, you know, don't eat it. Now notice, Eve is not yet created in the story. So that means that Adam had to relate to Eve after God created her, and so the information she gets is secondhand. It may be that God taught her later on, but we're not told that in Scripture. So just taking what Scripture says at face value, Adam related to Eve, you can eat anything you want in the garden except for that tree in the middle, which is the tree of good and evil. So we see here that uh, the serpent approaches Eve, but he approaches her when she's alone. And as the point uh, I believe that we're trying to make here is that this is when we're at our lowest. When we don't have any Christian companionship, when there's nobody there to support us, a brother or sister in Christ that we can bounce things off of or talk about. <clears throat> when we're alone, when we're tired, you know, uh, he, he comes to us. And this is what he's doing to Eve. He catches her alone when Adam at the beginning was not there. And so we see here that uh, Satan uh, came to her and we see that uh, the same way he 
I guess we could say they tempted Jesus. Notice the three things, you know. She says that uh, she, she looked upon the fruit and uh, it was good for food. Now think of Jesus' first temptation. Turn the rocks into bread. So it looked good for food. And they say that the rocks were flat, round rocks. Well, the bread they made was without yeast, so it wouldn't be, you know, the loaves we got today. It'd be flat bread. So these rocks look very much uh, like it. And it says a woman not only saw it's good for food, it's delightful to look at. You know, uh, Satan tells him, jump off the you know, tower and everybody be astounded. You know, they'll be amazed that, you know, the angels will come and you won't even dash your foot upon a rock. You know, so <clears throat> it, people will be delighted, you know, make a show of it. And then the third one, desirable for obtaining wisdom. He comes to Jesus and he says to Jesus, bow down, worship me, and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Uh, notice how it's it's all lies, and this is why he's called the father of lies. He's trying to twist scripture, he's trying to maneuver it, and make it sound like he's being earnest with Jesus. You know, you don't have to go to the cross, you don't have to die, you know, you don't have to worry about that. All you've got to do is do it my way, and it'll be a lot easier on you, and, uh, you know, everybody be happy. Thirdly, the third thing we can say about this is that Satan casts doubt. Now note the question he poses to Eve to, to, uh, to, to, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? That's in verse uh, 1. Now notice that's a misquote. That's not what God says. If you go back to chapter 2 and you look at it, what well, God says, no, you may eat of any tree of the garden except for one. And so Satan comes and he's twisting it. He's trying to make her think that God doesn't care about you. He's keeping you back. He's keeping you from your full potential. Uh, he, he doesn't want you to have the good things in life. He knows he only gives you what he wants you to have. But that's not what God said. God says you can eat of any of the fruit. Remember, the fruit of eternal life was there, and they had access to it, but they never ate of it. Only one thing God denied them, and that was the tree of good and evil. But anyway, he misquotes God. Uh, and notice his subtle truth of the phrase, did God say it's sufficient to cast doubt in Eve's mind? Now listen to what Eve says. She says, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God says you must not eat it or touch it or you will die. That's verses 2 and 3. Now instantly we know that's not what God said. Because we read what God said. God said, don't eat of the tree that's in the middle of the garden. Probably, she's trying to elevate God, trying to, you know, hold him up as being righteous. And she says, no, we, we can't eat of it or touch it. You know, she's putting a greater prohibition on it than what God <coughs> himself had done. But then realize Eve responds correctly to the serpent with that caveat and she tells the serpent she's forbidden to eat the tree or to touch it. Now there's a commentator by the name of Louis Twerkberg, T-V-E-R-B-E-R-G, and here's what he says about Eve's exaggeration of God's word. It says Eve was probably trying to be faithful to God in her conversation with Satan. But when she told the serpent God's regulations regarding the tree, she overstated what God had said by saying that they must not even touch it or they will die. She was exaggerating for God's sake by making his rule more strict than it really was. We must be mindful that our own zeal does not cause us to go beyond God or put words in God's mouth. 
we need to always speak or let God's truth be known. So in her zealousness, she's probably, you know, just uh, thinking to herself, well, if I can't eat of it, I don't even want to touch it. You know, I don't want to go near that thing, you know, because it, it causes death. But notice, fourth, Satan uh, caters to falsehood. Now, when Eve stretched the truth, and she said that the prohibition regarding the tree was that you should not touch it, Satan immediately jumps upon it and says, no, you shall not surely die for touching it. That's the implication here. He's not saying, if you eat of it, you won't die. He's taking her exaggeration, and he's saying that if you touch it, you're not going to die for touching it. He knew the truth. He knew what God had prohibited her from. And so what he's doing is casting doubt in the mind of Eve. What did God really say then? And if this was imparted to her through her husband, you know, she's thinking to herself now, well, maybe he didn't have it right. So it comes down to her over-exaggeration leading Satan to open the door for her to begin to distrust God. And Satan says to her, truthfully, you touch it, you will not die. At that point, Satan's temptation great, uh, gained credibility in her mind, and he corrected her own misstatement. Fifthly, Satan characterizes the truth. You know, what a foothold in Eve's mind, the serpent convinced her that there are no consequences for disobeying God. You know, if I'm not going to die for touching him, maybe I won't die if I eat it. You know, the seed of doubt is planted, and he's there to, uh, you know, tell her, I'm really your friend. I'm the one you should be listening to. God, he, he knows you're going to be like him. He knows that you're just going to be elevated and you're no good from evil. And he's jealous because you'll be on an equal basis with him. Doug, don't you mm -hmm. think that uh, that people, you know, unsaved, basically unsaved people, uh, they they believe that there, there won't be any consequences? Oh, yeah. And, and that... Because everybody that I talk to, you know, will say, oh, my, they, they went to heaven. Immediately, like, everybody, like, everybody that I are here, oh, they went to heaven, they went to heaven. Yeah. You know, so they don't believe there's any consequences. That's true. I mean, that's, a lot of it has to do with the denial of Satan, though. You know, that's the whole thing while we're looking at this is because, uh, I know one place after this I read that it says that, uh, you know, the joke is he's a little man in a red suit with a pitchfork. And uh, it's a joke today. You know, comedians tell jokes. We had what's his name who said the devil made me do it. You know, he dressed up as a woman. And, you know, it's always the devil made me do it. And I believe you're right. There are. People think there are no consequences because they don't see God as God really is, as he's revealed himself. They see a caricature of God that they made in their own mind. And that is that they think God is a God of love, and he is, but he's more than that. And so because he's a God of love, they think that means he won't send anyone to hell and that everybody will go to heaven when they die. When I was talking to this, the leader of this group years ago, when I lived in Illinois, she, she said that uh, God is too good of God to let us go to hell. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the kind of thing too good of say. God. You know. Yeah, that's the kind of thing, and we've got churches that teach that today. And I was trying to put a scripture and, and talk to her and tell her, no, it, it, there's going to be there. Mm -hmm. There, you're going to have to, there's going to be consequences. There's, you know, your God, sin. God is a God Doesn't of love. You're going to go to heaven. But God is also a God of righteousness. Yeah. And God hates sin. 
and he can't allow sin to be in his presence. He has to destroy sin wherever he finds it. So he has to do something to take away our sins so we can be in his presence. And the way he's done that is through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And those who believe upon him, he makes them the new creatures. So he takes off their body of sin and he puts on the new clothes of righteousness. And so, yes, God is a God of love. He's a God of light. He's, you know, all these different metaphors of the Bible to try and show us what God is like. But the Old Testament makes clear he's also a God of wrath. And that he's angry. The Old Testament says he's angry with the sinner every day. You know, I've heard people say, well, you know, he, he don't hate the sinner. He just hates their sin. Well, it's not their sin that's going to go to hell. The whole person is going to go to hell. And so God not only hates the sin, he hates the sinner who, who's committing the sin. But it's a righteous hatred. And that's why we have a hard time with it is because we're not righteous. We're not pure, you know, ourselves. We're still in a body of sin. And we continually sin on a daily basis. And so we can't understand. And that's why we're not to judge. It's because we really, I can't say who should go to heaven and who should go to hell. Because God sees the heart, and I can't. I look on the outward, but God looks inside. Yeah. Aren't we supposed to judge the Christian, though, and not the world? Is Christ, they're already judged? If you mean by that, we, are we to judge their works? Doug, you shouldn't be drinking. That's not good for you. You know better yeah. than that. I'm judging you? Yeah. Right? You're a Christian? Okay. I've talked to, to other people about this, but... I'm getting off we're, Yeah, we're getting off topic, but we, that's okay. We, this we, is we a short back. chapter. Okay. Uh, the Bible tells us when we are to judge the other Christian, it's talking about outward blatant sin. Okay. It's not secret sin. It's not sins of the heart. It's the outward blatant sin. And Jesus talks about hatred, murder, adultery. So, yes, those type of things. Drunkenness. Yeah, anything that is outward and blatant and evident we are to confront other brothers. And he tells us in Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 18, you go alone, you go privately, right. because the reason for it is so it don't, other people don't know. The whole idea of going is to bring the person back in rec reconciliation. That's what the whole motive should be. If you're not going for reconciliation, you shouldn't be going at all. And so you're trying to get the person to repent and turn from the sin. If they won't, you take two witnesses. The, what the witnesses are for to say to the guy who's claiming he has no sin, no, we've seen it, we know about it, here's the evidence we have. And then if he won't listen to the three of them, then they're to bring it before the church. And if he still won't repent, then excommunication, yeah, which is the last resort. You shouldn't be judging anybody. <laughs> According to the scripture, you shouldn't be judging anybody. We're not to be judging for our salvation. Yeah. That's oh, what yeah. the Bible tells us. Yeah. I can't say who's going to heaven or who's oh, going yeah, to hell. Oh, yeah, that's true. But I can judge when I see an outward blatant sin that yeah. a person's committing, and I can say to them, that's not pleasing to God. Yeah, you, yeah that's the Bible mm -hmm. says to do that. Yeah. Paul says that, right? Is Corinthians, he says that? So what? That tell your brother to stop it. That's Matthew. Matthew. Yeah. Chapter 18, verses 15 through 18. Yeah. But, yeah, we're, that doesn't mean I'm going to pick a Christian apart because he doesn't believe exactly like I do. That's not the same thing. There are a lot of gray areas in the Bible, what in the Greek is called adiaphora. And there's some things that are secondary and Christians should overlook because they're unimportant. Like eschatology, when you're talking about how things are going to be when Jesus comes again, nobody really knows. We're all guessing. But isn't he coming back to judge? Yeah, but I'm talking about how he's going to come back. Is he going to come all back right. pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, right. post-tribulation? Yeah. Fire. You fire. Know, so these things are unimportant. It doesn't really matter. And so we shouldn't 
be judging other Christians based upon the way they interpret uh, certain scripture. And so, yeah, the only thing that the Christian is supposed to do for other Christian when they see them in outward blatant sin, I keep saying that over and over so people will recognize, we're talking about you're trying to help the person get out of their sin, reconcile them back to Christ, and make them a good citizen of the church once again. Uh, but other than that, no, we're not to judge. Yeah, it, as what Dot was saying, uh, we are to be discerning, and that's part of discernment. But we're not to judge as far as salvation. Right. A Christian can never... This is why when Jesus says in Matthew uh, chapter... What is it? It's 5, 6, where he says, if you say to your brother... Uh, I can't think of the, the word that he uses, but he uses a, a word, and it means you stupid fool. He says, uh, you're in line to be the fires of hell. Now what he's talking about there is when you call a person a fool, it's talking in the Bible always about a godless fool. You read the book of uh, Proverbs. And it's and I never mentioned full, it's talking about somebody who won't believe in God. So when you say to your brother, you're a godless fool, or you're a fool, you're ready to be judged by God because what you're saying is you're going to go to hell. You're condemning your brother to hell. And you have no right to judge your brother whether or not he's going to heaven or hell. Only God sees the heart. And that's the thing we've got to remember. We're never to judge another person by outward external means. I can, you know, look at you and say, Jim, you're a great Christian. I believe you're going to go to heaven. But with certainty, I can't say that. Because I don't know. I don't know what you're like when you're alone. Your wife probably could tell me some stories. But, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but the thing about it is, is that we ourselves, we can't look at another individual. We. The heart is deceitful, the Bible says, right, wicked. Beyond all, yeah. And, and so, if we can't even control ourselves, who are we to be jumping on our brother just because he has certain thoughts and none of us are going to be perfect in this life? We are all struggling and we will struggle till the day Jesus comes again or we die. <coughs> when I was talking to the leader, you know, we were just talking about people in general, you know, mm -hmm. not any certain person, just people in general. Like everybody is going to go to heaven. And that's what I was talking to that is in self because only God knows and yeah. that some people will go to hell, you know. But we know the them. Bible teaches that not everybody's going to heaven. That's what I told them. Yeah. yeah. So okay, let's get back it says the Lord we've got to understand he's omniscient that means he knows all things perfectly he's omnipotent which means he's all-powerful he's immutable which means he doesn't change God is the same yesterday today and tomorrow he's beyond reproach God is unable to sin because if he sinned he couldn't be God so God is not able to sin. He is perfect in holiness. And here's the thing. Yes, God may be a God of love, but he's also a God of holiness. And this is why he can't bear sin in his presence. And, and so, having said all that, once Eve and Adam's eyes were opened, we see that the knowledge of sin really wrecked them. It, I mean, they went from being innocent they were never perfect. Nobody in the Garden of Eden was perfect. They were innocent. They weren't saved. They weren't lost. They were innocent. And it was based upon works. Adam and Eve are the only people who could have got to heaven by works. By not eating the tree of good and evil. Once they fell, nobody could be saved by works. Everybody had to be saved by grace. But they were to do one thing, not eat of the fruit of the tree of good and evil. They didn't do that. They fell to it. And it wrecked them. 
It wrecked their descendants. It wrecked their children. Look, one son immediately, you know, after this kills another son. Uh, things become so horrible that by chapter 6, God destroys the world. He so, said, man, you guys, you only got a few generations and you're this bad? And he wipes them out. Starts over with Noah and his family. And so we see here that the knowledge of sin did not make them like God. In fact, all it did is condemn them before God. And this, the whole thing was a subtle web of deception that Satan cleverly did with Eve to seduce her. And the part I look at and just throw up my hands and says after she ate of it, she handed it to her husband and he ate it. You know, he's supposed to be the head of the household. He's supposed to be the spiritual leader. He was there before Eve. And she eats of it. And he goes, oh, it looks good to me. You know, he takes a bite of himself. Now, where was he? Why didn't he speak up? Why didn't he say to her, no? Remember the prohibition. Remember what God told us. But he didn't. Eve was deceived. Adam just caved. And, uh, yeah. you know, we see. Anyway. Notice that uh, Adam and Eve, their eyes are open now, but the first vision is not divine omniscience. It's a revelation that they're naked and they find it necessary to take fig leaves to cover themselves. They have lost the glorified bodies they had been having with God uh, while they were in the garden. Uh, they had shame for the first time. And we see that their flesh is going to become corruptible. And it horrified them and trying to cover their bodies as if they're trying to deny the effects of their sin against God. Now let's put a few leaves over this. Maybe God won't notice. Now that's kind of how we do it, isn't it? You know, we sin and oh, God don't really care about that. That's just a little white, white lie. And, you know, we just say, say the prayer, you know. First John 1, 8 and 9, if, we confess our sin. God's righteous and just forgive us of all our sins and unrighteousness. And so we don't repent. We don't really think anything about it. We just confess it to God and say, oh, it's, it's done. It's over. But that's not true repentance and you're not forgiven. You have to truly have a repentant heart and go to God in true repentance. But this is not what they did when God came looking for them. They, they hid. They ran away from God. This is why salvation has always been God finding us, not us finding God. You know, they were hiding from God. Their sin hid them, made them hide from God. That's like in the book of Revelation at the end times. People are going to hide in caves and under the rocks saying, fall upon us and hide us from the wrath of the one who is coming. That's man's response to God. They hate God. They don't want anything to do with God. But God comes looking for us. And God manifests himself to us and shows us in a lot of different ways. He's real and he's good. And he does it through nature. He does it through uh, other means. But these are just things that open us up. It's not things that lead to salvation. Uh, because the Bible teaches it's only faith in Christ that a person is truly saved. Kurt Strassner says, Adam and Eve were promised liberation, but instead they reached, uh, received shame. They were promised that they would become like God, but instead they found themselves hiding from God. So God comes and he confronts Adam and Eve. They're quick to confess, which is good. <laughs> But their confession is to pass the buck. Isn't it? Right? That woman you gave. Yeah. <laughs> That's what he said. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she says to Adam, Adam, did you do this? Yeah, but God, if you wouldn't have gave me this woman, and what he's doing is blaming God. It's mm -hmm. your fault, God. You gave her to me. And so she learns very quickly from her husband. And he says, Eve, what about it? Well, it's that serpent. You know, he came and he was subtle and he tricked me and 
before I knew what was happening, it was in my mouth. And I, you know, I told him I didn't even want to touch it. And the serpent, well, he wasn't speaking. And so we see here that God cursed him, cursed the ground, and Adam and Eve were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, and we have the things we have today because of it. Every disease, war, children dying, anything else you want to think about that's horrible in this life, it's because of Adam and Eve's sin. Everything is caused, disease, are all caused by sin of some kind, somewhere, somehow, at the very beginning. And it can be, all be traced back to this event. Now, even though God did throw them out of the garden, he gave them one promise before they did. He gave them a grace statement. And it's in <clears throat> Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Now, there's 400 messianic promises in the Old Testament, but this is the very first one about the Messiah who was to come. And God has, uh, I don't have an actual quote from the Bible. Somebody want to read that for me? Just, and, I will, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Okay, so God is promising a future male descendant of Eve that will strike, and the word strike here means crush, smite in pieces, or greatly injure the head of the serpent. While the serpent, the worst he can do is to strike the deliverer's heel. That is bruising. Won't kill him, but will bruise him. Now John Eckerberg says, God is saying the male seed of the woman be victorious over Satan because he, the serpent, will be mortally wounded. Yes, Jesus died, but Jesus rose from the grave, and that was God's plan. You go to Acts chapter 2, and we read here in Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost that God is the one who determined that Jesus would die for the sins of mankind, and he just used Judas and Satan to bring it about. Now, they thought they are going to be done with him. Mm. You know, have you ever heard of a sermon called, It's Friday, but Sunday's coming? Well, that's one of the recent, I'd say in the last 20 years, it was one sermon that was really, you know, preached over and over again. Uh, but on Friday, it looks like Satan is the victor. You know, Jesus is dead. They put him in the ground, in the cave, whatever. And uh, there's probably a great celebration in hell. We killed the Son of God. We, we kid him, you know. God's not as powerful as we are. You know, we, we had our plans and, you know, let's have a great celebration. But by Sunday morning, Jesus raises from the dead and Satan realizes he's been tricked. The great tricker has been tricked himself and this was part of God's plan to bring about redemption. And we see here that the celebration stopped. And the Bible says that Satan now knows his time is short. And it won't be long before Jesus comes again. And he's going to destroy him by throwing him into uh, the lake of fire. Now, a final thought before we move on. <clears throat> The sight of God walking in the garden of Genesis 3.8 as first recorded appearance of an angel of the Lord. We said this is a Christophany. If this is Jesus, then God the Father never took human form. God appeared in the bush, God appeared in the fire, God appeared in clouds. But we have no time that God appears as a human. Only Jesus did in his different Christophanies. Uh, that is taking on the flesh. Jesus did it, but he didn't take on flesh permanently until he was born of a virgin uh, later on. But in the Old Testament, he comes and he appears as what's called the angel uh, of God, or the angel of the Lord. So anyway, if this is Jesus walking 
with Adam and Eve in the garden, it means <clears throat> that if this angel of the Lord is the pre-incarnate Christ, that means he's delivering the verse prophecy about his own future, <clears throat> that his mission to come to earth and to rescue fallen people from the ravages of sin. Now, it's interesting to think about. You know, that this first promise of a Redeemer may be given by Jesus himself without saying, I'm that, I'm that Redeemer. You know, he, what he's saying is that, no, one of your descendancy, a male descendant is going to come and he's going to give his life for sin. One other example maybe can help us uh, illustrate Satan's being so subtle as a father of lies. As we talked about in Jesus' uh, temptations, we see, if you want to turn with me, Matthew chapter 4, verses 5 through 7. In Matthew chapter 4, you know, we're told at the very beginning that Jesus had been fasting for 40 days. Notice Satan doesn't come to him until after he's already been fasting for 40 days. So after 40 days, you'd be pretty hungry. And the first temptation he comes to him is about food, turning his loaves, uh, rocks into bread. But now, verse 5, we see that he takes him to the second uh, what are we uh, temptation and that's what we're going to be looking at in Matthew chapter 4 verse 5 then the devil took him to the holy city had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said if you are the son of God throw yourself down for it is written he will give angels orders concerning you they will support you with the hands so that you will not strike a foot against the stone and Jesus said to him it is written do not test the Lord your God now, Satan is quoting from Psalms 91, <clears throat> verses 11, 20, 11 and 12, and he applies it to Jesus. Psalms 91 ultimately is a messianic psalm, but not so exclusively. We see that, of all things, it's not a double dog dare God. You know, uh, I'm going to do it, and I bet God's going to come through. Uh, what he's saying here is that he's misappropriating it because really this is about the Israelites. And what God is saying, he's going to protect the Israelite nation. But more than that, <clears throat> it, it goes further in that it's not a promise, you know, that you know Jesus can jump from the temple and the angel is going to come and get him and protect him. God makes general promises to us. He made a general promise to the people of Israel here in Psalms 91 that he's going to watch over them and protect them as long as they trust him and serve him. Now we know they didn't, and because of their sin, they went into exile. So the promise was predicated upon the fact that they had to be obedient and trust in God. But as long as they did, God promised he would deliver them. It's kind of like the promise that God gives generally to us today. Raise up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'd not depart thereof. That's, that's not a guarantee. I, I show you two or three preacher's kids that didn't, didn't take. You know, they you know, were raised right. They were given all the different uh, benefits, you know, but they want nothing to do with Christianity. You see, it's not, it's a promise, a general promise that God is making saying, if you do all the right things, if you're consistent in it, you love your children, bring them up in the admonition of the Lord, generally speaking, most of them, even if they stray when they're younger, they'll come back when they're older. Now, it's a general promise. But again, we want to make guarantees of God's promises, and they can't. Some of them are not made to be guarantees. And that's why some 
parents' hearts are broken when their children turn out and they're terribly wicked. Uh, they can't understand it. Why well, raise them right? And so the rest of their lives they blame their self. The Bible says once they're out on their own, it's no longer on you, it's on them. No longer will the fathers eat sour grapes and their children's teeth be put on edge. What's he talking about? Well, in the Old Testament it says that the father who sins is going to be passed on to the second and third generation. Well, people claim that's unjust. So God said, okay, here's what we'll do. Every person will answer for their own sin. And so that means when your children, you raise them right, they get to be a certain age, they're responsible for themselves. Now, the thing to do as a Christian always is pray for them. We can always pray for them. That's the most we can do. But we don't have a guarantee just because we raised them right that they could fall away and they're for sure going to come back again. It's not a guarantee. It's a common promise. In addition, Isaiah uh, talks about visions of a future in which the Messiah's reign in which the servant is subdued. And he also uh, pictures a future in which the lion is completely tamed. And that's showing that, uh, you know, he's, when Satan is finally uh, thrown into the lake of fire. So we see, remember that Jesus tells his own disciples in granting them authority when he first sent them out in Luke chapter 10. He tells them that they will have authority over snakes and scorpions. Now there's a lot of silly people out there who think they can handle snakes and knock it, but they don't understand this is a metaphor, metaphor, I wanted to use a longer word, but I couldn't get it out, but it's metaphorical, finally got it, it's metaphorical for evil spirits, that he's giving them power to cast out evil spirits, and we see that, and so when he talks about snakes and scorpions, he's not talking about you know, at the end of Mark where it says, you know, you can handle snakes. So it's probably a reference to Paul. Remember Paul was gathering wood and he throws it into the fire and the snake comes out of the fire and he bites him and the people said, hey, shit, you know, the sea didn't kill him. Let's sit back down. God's going to kill him. They watch for five minutes, ten minutes, half hour. He doesn't die. What's wrong? God didn't allow it to poison him. You know, so... We, we got to be mature in our thinking. We've got to start thinking biblically and instead of uh, taking everything uh, literal, especially in the places like the book of Revelation where it's not to be taken literally. It's an apocalyptic book, which means that things are not as they seem. Okay, so Satan is a liar and a deceiver. I don't know if I said this a while ago, but the, the whole idea of a little guy in a red suit with a pitchfork, that came from the Middle Ages. We start seeing it in art. You know, this is also called the Dark Ages. It's when the uh, Church of Rome, you know, the, they, they are the king and the Pope at the same time. That's why it's dark ages, it's because the Pope has become the ruling king at the time, and <clears throat> there, it's where the Roman Catholics come from. And so anyway, they're ruthless. Most of them are adulterers and murderers. And you read the history of what happened during the dark ages, and you see these popes weren't righteous men at all. They're you know, they're just hungry for money and power and a lot of other bad things. They were corrupt. But it was during this time because religion was so impressed upon the people because the king was the pope and ruling that they began to think rightly about Satan being an adversary. So in their art, they started drawing, well, what would Satan look like? And these artists started drawing horns and he had a red suit and he had a pitchfork you know that's the most hideous thing they could think of 
So they were doing it to try to scare people and show them that Satan was not somebody to uh, be fooling around with. Today we got people casting out Satan. You know, you know, Satan be gone. It's interesting because in the book of Jude it says that <clears throat> when uh, I believe it was Michael was wrestling with the devil over the body of Moses that he wouldn't say anything to Satan other than may the Lord rebuke you. So if God's chief angel didn't cast Satan out, what makes us think that we've got more power than him? We're not to be fooling around with demons and all these other things. The Bible tells us resist the devil and he'll flee from you. That's the power we have. The power to resist, the power to say no, the power to cry out to God to say, God, help me. And God, through the Holy Spirit, will enable us to resist the devil and then he will flee from us. But we have no power to bind the devil or any of these other ridiculous things that people claim today. <clears throat> Watching the time? 737. Oh, okay, good. We said that uh, Satan masquerades as an angel of light. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we see that Paul talks about people that Satan uses. And that's the thing we need to understand is that Satan, why he doesn't personify himself like Jesus did, that he didn't take on a human body. He works through, through human beings, and we talked about this. <clears throat> Well, we see that uh, Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14 and 15, he says that there's uh, servants, excuse me, who are called super apostles who disguise themselves as ministers of righteousness. So this is Satan working through what he calls super apostles. What happened is Paul went in there, Paul set up this church, he spent a year and a half with them teaching them gave him doctrine, and he goes away, and there's probably a second letter that we don't have from Corinthians. And the reason I say that is because we know in the second Corinthians that we do have, Paul's answering five or six questions that they have asked him. And so probably he sent them a second letter, and they sent him back some questions wanting more clarification. In second Corinthians, that's what he's doing. He's answering the questions, also condemning the young man who's living with his stepmother and all the other sins that are going on. But in the meantime, Paul has left and these so-called super apostles come in and they're saying, don't listen to Paul. <laughs> What's Paul know? No, we're, we're really better than Paul. We're better apostles than him. And uh, what you need to do is uh, follow us and we'll show you some real miracles, some real power so we see here that uh, these so-called super apostles are being used by Satan to deceive the people. So let's finish by asking the question, what does it mean that Satan is the father of lies? Well, first of all, let's consider that Satan is the original liar. Think about that for a moment. Now we have no record Scripture doesn't tell us, you know, the lies that he told. We know that uh, we're not told how Satan even fell into sin. We're not privy to that. All we know is that when God created, in the book of Job, it says, and all the sons of God, uh, all the sons of God praise God for his uh, creation. So at that time, all the angels were there with God, and they were all praising God at creation. But sometime between God saying, it's done, it's very good, I'm going to rest on seventh day, and Adam and Eve, Satan falls. But we're not told how that even happened, because I guess God figures it's not that important. All we need to know is that he did fall, and that he is the one who's trying to lead people astray, and he is also the original liar. <clears throat> at some point, we see that Satan bristled at God's govern, the way he governs, and he employs 
lies and deception uh, to entice other created beings. Uh, if we take literally where it says that a third of the angels, uh, the dragon pulled down a third of the stars from the sky, it's probably a reference to a third of the angels that fell with Satan, that they rebelled against God at that time. And so we see that uh, God no longer had said it is very good, and Satan swoops in and turns everything into evil. Now Augustine, everybody know who Augustine is? Augustine, tomato, tomato, <laughs> potato, potato. Augustine, Augustine, same person. Our month, August, you know, derived from his name. Anyway, here's what he says. <clears throat> It's not everyone who tells a lie that is the father of lies. For if thou hast a lie from another and uttered it, thou indeed hast lied in giving utterance to the lie. But thou art not the father of that lie, because thou hast got it from another. But the devil was a liar of himself. He begat his own falsehood. He heard it from no one. As God the Father begat his Son, the truth, so the devil, having fallen, begot falsehood as his son. Second of all, Satan is a liar by nature. <clears throat> Lies reveal his fallen nature. It shows who he really is. Now, Jesus makes this clear when he says, Satan, you can't tell the truth. You know, he says to John chapter 8, you're like your father. You you can't know the truth. You don't. It can hit you in the face, and you don't know when it's true. Uh, and that's because they're fallen, because there is no truth in them. John 8:44. And so we see, because of a rebellious heart, he hates the truth, and his family hates the truth. And his animosity towards Jesus, at least in part, is aimed at the one who not only knows the truth tells the truth, but is the truth. Now Jesus goes on to say that when the evil one tells a lie, he speaks from his own nature. So somebody has interpreted this, uh, let me see, New International Version, when it said when, Jesus, uh, when Satan tells a lie, he speaks from his own nature, the New International Version says when he lies, he speaks his native language kind of helps you understand that he is the originator of all lie. He speaks out of his own nature or characteristic. Now notice the Bible says some things about Satan as a liar. Satan is known to fill people's hearts to lie, Acts 5.3. When we lie, we borrow from Satan. Yet when he lies, the motto of it is of his own framing and the motives are from himself. Number three, third, all lies link back to Satan. Every liar is the evil one's child and shares the fate in the lake of fire. And this is what's promised in Revelation 21.8. <clears throat> it says, from the beginning, every person is a carrier, every person is a victim, like mutated cancer cells. They didn't keep their first estate, and they changed and became something other than what they were supposed to be. And so that means that the chief financial officer who cooks the books, it's like when Satan says to Jesus, turn these stones into bread. Or when the charlatan, who's not really a man of God, you know, fleeces his flock, we see his parlor trick mimicking Satan's plan for Jesus to take a swan dive off of the temple. And the celebrity who gets away all morality in exchange for fleeting fame is only reading from the evil one's script when he offers Jesus a shortcut to the kingdom. Sin has never changed. Sin will never change. It's always the same. And we've got to recognize it, and at the same time, we've got to do everything we can uh, to fight against it. I'm told my mind, 
my mind is gone. <laughs> my, my time is up. Uh, let me read a uh, passage from Matthew Henry. Uh, Matthew Henry is from the 1600s. He was a commentator, a pastor. And we'll close with this. Matthew Henry observes the evil one as a deserter of the truth. He abode not in the truth, did not continue in the purity and rectitude of the nature wherein he was created, but left his first estate. When he degenerated from goodness, he departed from truth, for his apostasy was founded in a lie. And we can say that lies hurt and anger people, but we see that Jesus is the one who tells us the truth, and if we follow him faithfully, when we die, we won't suffer the repercussion of all of Satan's children, those who reject Jesus. Question comes. Um, Doug, I, I may have misheard uh, or misunderstood. How, how was Satan considered a, a murderer? back in Genesis during the time of Adam. We're going to see it. That's next week. Oh, okay. Yeah. Get, get next it. week is, okay. this week he is a liar. Next week he is a murderer from the beginning. Okay. I'll give you a hint. It's not talking about, as I said, I, I, when I first read it, I thought Cain and Abel. Mm -hmm. But it's not. He murdered humanity when he got them to sin in Adam and Eve. Uh, okay. And we're going to see there's three ways of death. Uh, physical death, spirit, uh, there's one in between. I can't think offhand. But anyway, there's, we'll look at three different waves of death and see how Satan caused all three of them to happen in human kind. Soul. Second one is soul. There's soul death and then there's spiritual death. Okay. Any questions? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that this evening we can come before you. We thank you that you love us with an everlasting love. We thank you, Father, that you made a plan of salvation before the foundation of the world. We thank you that you have a book of life, and you've written down all your children in that book. And Father, because of that, we are secure, and we can never fall away. Dear God, we just praise you for who you are. Let us look to you and understand you in the reality of not what we think you are, but who you tell us you are. We just praise you, our dear God, and we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay. Thank you, everybody. <clears throat>